afternoon, Senator Harkin, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with the National Center for Learning Disabilities today. My name is Erin Mayo, and I have a nonverbal learning disability. I'm a member of the Young Adult Leadership Council for the National Center for Learning Disabilities. My nonverbal learning disability affects my abstract language, and I have lower processing speed. Um, I'm excited to speak with you today as you are a champion of the ADA and the ADA ensured that I received the appropriate accommodations to succeed in the academic environment so that my learning disability would not affect my success. And I'm Susan Reynolds and I'm the field organizer for the National Center for Learning Disabilities. I am a learning disabled adult diagnosed with dyslexia and a visual motor processing disorder and I have ADHD. Um, I actually didn't grow up with the Americans with Disabilities Act. It passed when I was in high school. And um, I believe the first time we met, you referred to my generation as something that I still remember to this day, the first generation beneficiaries of the ADA. And you were, you were right. Um, I did not receive accommodations in IEP in high school or anything like that. But as soon as the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law, um, its effects were immediate. Um, I was the first student in my high school to receive testing accommodations for the SAT, which I couldn't get for the PSAT. And um, I was also receiving, going to receive accommodations in college, which I didn't receive when I was in high school. And that's all because of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I'm really excited to be speaking with you today because um, I consider you the grandfather of the ADA. <laughs> so. Um, Maybe great grandfather about that. No, no, I would never say that. <laughs> um, you have been a lifelong champion for people with disabilities as well as their families, and we are incredibly grateful for your work. And as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, we wanted to ask you some questions and, and talk to you more about a little bit about the history and where you see the ADA going, um, especially with our young adults and our, our I refer to them as the, the generation that protects the, the ADA because that's what they are. And, and I think that their contribution to the disability space is, is needed. So um, I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome, Senator Harkin. Well, Susan, thank you for having me, and thanks for your leadership and all the people at the National Center for Learning Disabilities. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, your involvement and for keeping the, pushing the envelope all the time. I appreciate that. Well, you're uh, welcome. Um, so, Senator Harkin, I was rereading the book, Enabling Acts, yes. over the weekend, um, as well as Judith Human's book, Being Human, yes. um, and in both those books, there's mention about your brother, Frank. And in fact, you have, have talked a lot about Frank and your nephew, Kelly, as they were sources of inspiration for your advocacy. Um, what else about the ADA or what else, what else made the ADA so important to you? I, we know about the family that, was, that impacted you, but what else was it that you saw? Well, you know, uh, my, uh, my uh, development in, t in terms of uh, disability awareness uh, had an ever-enlarging path. Uh, when I first got elected to Congress, I was very myopic. I was only interested in deafness and communication disorders because of my brother. Uh, in fact, uh, Senator R Jennings Randolph of West Virginia and I delivered to then President Carter in the White House, the first decoding box that decoded closed captions. So, and then I was very instrumental in helping to set up the National Captioning Institute, uh, actually uh, out here in Virginia. Um, so that was really sort of kind of my focus. Hmm? Uh, but then my nephew, Kelly, my sister's boy, uh, 19 years old, got injured in an accident and became severely paraplegic, almost quadriplegic. And um, uh, he was in the military and then he uh, came back and then used the GI Bill and went to college at Colorado State in, in Fort Collins. And I remember him calling me up once and he said, Uncle Tom, I need some help. I said, well, what's that, Kelly? He said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on the GI Bill, I wanna go to college 
there's a class on the second floor of this building uh, and there's no elevator, so they won't let me take the class. I said, well, this can't be so. <laughs> this, is, this is nonsense. And I remember going out to Colorado where they lived to see him and uh, work on this issue. I thought, then it hit me, the built environment mm -hmm. is such a, a barrier for all kinds of people with physical disabilities. Well, then that broadened my viewpoint of what disabilities were. And then shortly thereafter, I became acquainted with a family friend of mine in Iowa, Danny Piper, a young man with Down syndrome. Well, now I saw a whole new area of disabilities I hadn't thought about before. Uh, and that led me to people again with, uh, with autism. I, I then mm -hmm. first started learning about autistic kids and, and people with learning disabilities, developmental disabilities. And all of a sudden it came home to me that what was needed was a broad anti-discrimination law covering all forms of disabilities, not just deafness and communication disorders. So that was sort of my, my pathway that, that led, me to the, led me to this. That's, it's amazing how your, your experience starts because of your brother and then your nephew and then the meeting of new people and how that broadens your, um, your horizons and your scope. Um, when you think back to those years that you spent advocating for the Americans with Disabilities Act, was there a defining moment when you knew it was going to pass where nothing was going to stop the passage of the ADA? Well, yeah, there was. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> yes, I do remember that very well. Um, we'd had some real problems. Now we got it through the Senate. Yes. I was in charge of it. And I, and, and I was in charge of the subcommittee under then Senator Kennedy. Uh, and so we were able to get it through the Senate. But then it went to the House of Representatives. Yeah. And it got all boxed up in several different committees and subcommittees. And one committee chairman, a member of my own party, did not want the bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just languished there from September of 89 through the winter and into 90. And all of a sudden we realized we had to get this done before the election in 90. Uh, so in March of 1990, Bob Kafka, the head of ADAPT, who was ADAPT, uh, was, uh, called me. And uh, in the morning, he said, uh, uh, we're going to help you get that bill out of the house. Well, you know, Bob, uh, Bob uh, had been arrested already about 30 times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, sometimes he could be just a little bit over the edge. <laughs> I love Bob Kafka. And <laughs> so uh, I thought, well, what's, what are you going to do? And he said, well, watch the news tonight. We're going to help you get this bill through. I thought, oh, my God, what's he going to do? <laughs> That afternoon, Bobby Silverstein, my staff person who was so instrumental in drafting and doing all of the drafting of the bill, uh, said to me in the cabinet, said, you got to come out and see this. Well, what had happened is Bob Kafka had called the press and said this afternoon was going to be the biggest demonstration ever of persons with disabilities on the Capitol. So he, he was very smart. Bob's very smart. So he got all the press there. And I think there were maybe what... I, I don't remember the right number, 12, 15, 18 people in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. So not a big demonstration at all, but they rolled their chairs up to the Capitol steps. They all fell out of their wheelchairs and crawled up the Capitol yeah. steps. I'll bet you remember that. I, yeah, I remember seeing it on the oh, news. Well, all the evening news carried it. And there was this little girl, Jennifer Heelan, still lives around. She lives up in Baltimore, mm -hmm. eight years old. And the police were going to arrest her. <laughs> said, uh, she said, well, what about that man over there? And she, he said, well, he's, he's going into the Capitol. And she said, well, this is the only way I can get in. Well, I'm telling you, within just a couple of weeks, we got that bill out of the House of Representatives. I knew at that point we were going to get it done. It was wow. just a, it was a defining moment that crystallized everybody in the country as to how unfair things were. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember that. No, no, the capital crawl, as it's called. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it was uh, a topic of conversation at dinner that night after we saw it on the news. And we were stationed overseas, actually, so it made it onto the Armed Forces Network news, too. Wow, yeah, it, it, yeah. it was widely seen. So, Aaron, do you have some questions? Yeah, so our next question, Senator Harkin, was, what was your vision for the ADA, and what was your hope when the ADA passed for all people of all, ability, of all disabilities. Well, Aaron, you gotta remember what life was like uh, before the ADA. Uh, life was, for people just it was segregation. Uh, it was segregated education. For example, my brother was taken from home, sent to a separate school for the deaf and dumb, as they were called at that time. Uh, low expectations. People with disabilities were not expected to do anything. Uh, there were very few choices uh, for people. Uh, dead end jobs, so sheltered workshops, no challenges or, uh, or no opportunity for growth in, in, in employment. The built environment was, 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 uh, was uh, a barrier, as I've, I've said earlier. So everything was sort of meant to exclude people with disabilities. My goal, well, let me put it this way. There were four goals in the ADA. Full participation, mm -hmm. equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. So my vision was that we would tear down the physical barriers. We would provide for meaningful accommodations. Uh, we would, um, um, include, make, make education inclusive rather than exclusive, uh, and that we would do all we could to provide independence, high expectations, choice uh, available to persons with disabilities. That was my vision, that we would get rid of that old medical model <laughs> of disability, that there's something wrong with you. If you have a disability, there's something wrong with you and you need to be fixed. <laughs> and if you can't be fixed, you need to be isolated. That's the way it's always been. Change that to a different model, that there is nothing wrong with disability. It is, it is a, a natural part of human existence. And if there's anything wrong, it is with the society and the way society has structured itself, both physically structured itself and attitudinally structured itself to think about persons with disabilities. So my vision was to change these attitudes, get people to, to not look at a person and define that person by a disability, but to define that person by the whole person, who that person is, what are their goals, what are their dreams, uh, what, are the, what are their abilities, what do they want to do? Uh, so that uh, we become a fully inclusive society. Great, thank you, Senator Harkin. Thanks, Erin. So we hear a lot about um, how ADA took, you know, allowed, you know, took down, I guess, or, you know, made things accessible for people with physical disabilities. We know we hear about ramps, we you know about the elevators, um, and Judith Human actually said when she was on uh, Trevor Noah that she sees more families using elevators who are pushing strollers at the metro here in DC, right? And she goes, so it's, you know, an elevator has helped everyone, right? Sure. But what about those of us with invisible disabilities, uh, especially learning disabilities, ADHD? How do you think that um, the ADA has supported us and how has the ADA been essential for us? Well, because we didn't, we didn't delineate one disability from another. I mean, this is a comprehensive bill. And as you know, under uh, Section 504 of the Rehab Act, uh, that made certain definitions and definitions of whether you had a disability or were considered to be, to have a disability, a history of a disability or considered to have one. So that uh, we fully in, 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 we fully uh, involved and thought about 
incorporating into this persons with what you, we call invisible disabilities, um, whether it's learning disabilities or um, autism or ADHD, whatever it might be, and to make sure that the law applied to them in terms of both non-discrimination, but also supportive services and accommodations, reasonable accommodations. That's why, as you said something about having a coach to help you with the entrance exam or a mm -hmm. SAT or whatever it might be, to give more time. Uh, uh, we fully, fully intended that, that these kind of things would take place and that a person with a, an invisible disability uh, in wanting to achieve something or to do and exercise their choice. Let me put that exercise their choice about what he or she wanted to do that if there were obstacles in their way of a nature that accommodations could help them get through that, then those accommodations had to be made, such as uh, longer times to take tests. Um, um, uh, uh, tests in different forms, for example, things like that, uh, that uh, can be administered. So, no, I, 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 I think, and, and again, the other, the other part of that, Susan, is, 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 is to break down some of the attitudinal barriers that people without disabilities have. Um, uh, I, I think uh, especially, especially people that have uh, these uh, mistaken ideas and yes. attitudes about persons with, with, uh, with these invisible uh, disabilities. In other words, bit by bit, piece by piece, year by year, get these attitudes to change. And I think, we, I think we've come quite a ways. I mean, we're not totally there yet. I see it happen all the time. We still have lawsuits on discrimination and stuff. I know that. Yeah. Sadly. But we do. But um, just to let you know, I receive ADA accommodations when I advocate in my son's school for his IEP. Oh, sure. So, yeah. Right. And so that's a um, little bit of personal uh, connection there. I mean, that's what ADA has, has personally done for me in adulthood. So well, and that I know Aaron has a couple more questions for you, Senator. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry, Aaron. I didn't mean to cut you off, hon. No, it's fine. Um, Senator Harkin, our next question is, in your speech when the ADA passed, you talked about breaking down barriers. Do you think we've been successful in doing that, or do we have more work to do as advocates? And you kind of already touched on this a little bit. Um, I, I think we have broken down a lot of barriers in the last 30 years. Um, I think we have a ways to go. Uh, uh, and the built environment, as I keep saying, is much better for persons with physical disabilities. But I think we have a long way to go yet in some of the attitudinal barriers as it pertains to employment. Uh, that's one of the four goals of the ADA that we have not done very well at. Uh, it is just a blot on our national character that the rate of unemployment of adults with disabilities today is about where it was 30 years ago. Uh, so we've got to do better. And that's what I've devoted myself to since I retired from the Senate with the harkinsummit.org, and that is working with the private sector to get them to understand uh, more about hiring persons, training, and retaining persons with disabilities, and to break down some of the uh, attitudinal barriers that HR human resources have in hiring uh, persons with disabilities. So um, we've got we've got a ways to go there. Also, I think this COVID nineteen uh, has alarmed me uh, that that we may have taken a step backward. I, I don't know. I, I'm just so disturbed when I hear reports that persons with disabilities have a higher rate of infection than the general populace because many of them, especially with um, 
with uh, uh, Down syndrome and other kinds of, of, of disabilities are in group homes mm -hmm. and they aren't uh, informed well enough about what to do. And so the virus has spread rapidly uh, among persons with disabilities. And secondly, we have not done a good enough job of getting information out in a manner that is understandable and um, acceptable by persons with disabilities about what to do. Um, um, you know, I, it, it, it's just, it's like one of my great friends who has Down syndrome, every time he sees me, he wants to give me a hug. That's wonderful, but not now. And so somehow we have to tell him, Gene, we have to tell him, you know, that not, not now because of this illness. And, and it takes time, but through communications that can be done. I just don't think we've done a, a good enough job in healthcare. The third thing I would say is that, that when we uh, come out of this coronavirus, that and employment starts to come back, people with disabilities should not be last in line. In other words, if you've had a company and you've laid off 100 people, it shouldn't be that you hire 95 and then say, oh, now we got to hire some person with a disability. <laughs> no, they should be right in the front row with everybody else uh, when the employment starts to come back again, just like they need to be in the front row in terms of, of, of vaccinations, if we get a, a vaccine and things like that. People with disabilities should not be thought of last. They ought to be right up in front with everybody else. Great, thank you, Senator Harkin. That's a really great point. Um, and our final question is, yeah. what would you say to young adults or young people with disabilities who never lived in a world without ADA, but continue to advocate for equity, access, and inclusion in today's world? Say that again, Aaron. Say, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having okay. a little, but as you can see, I can't hear very well. Okay, uh, what would you say to young people with disabilities who never lived through a world without the ADA, but continue to advocate for equity, access, and inclusion in today's world? Well, what I would say to the young people is don't take it for granted. Uh, this law is not, the ADA is not self-actuating. In other words, uh, it is a protection. Uh, it does provide for uh, action by accommodations, things like that. But you, you just can't say, well, it's, it's, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, we still have to struggle and fight for rights, uh, for making sure that Inclusion is not just something to talk about, but is an actuality. Young people have to understand that, 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 well, as I've often said, when we passed the ADA, and I think I said this in my floor speech, I said, we haven't given a nickel to a person with a disability. There's not a dollar in a handout. There's nothing like that. What we did do, is we broke down the barriers. We opened the doors and we said to people with disabilities, go get them. So you still have to exercise um, energy and effort to accomplish things. Uh, it was never intended to continue this mindset of pity and patronizing attitudes that somehow we without disabilities know better for you than what you know for yourself. So young people, uh, the doors are open, the barriers are down, and now you've got to go for your dreams, fight for them just like anybody else, and don't take no for an answer, and don't take the back seat. Thanks, Senator Harkin, and thank you for all the work that you did in the Senate throughout your many years. Thank you, Erin. Well, I think we're done, Senator Harkin, and I just wanted to say um, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for your continued support.
for people with disabilities. Um, you have, you've blazed a trail for us. Uh, you really have. You, you made life possible. You made hopes and dreams possible for so many of us. Uh, uh, to me, I think the employment and the education pieces are some of the biggest parts of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and I don't know, I just absolutely love them. <laughs> um, but I actually refer to this as my most favorite legislation because I think it is some of the greatest legislation ever. And that is because of the work of you and so many other um, U.S. Senators like Bob Dole and Kennedy and um, even Senator John McCain um, right. was Thank very you. supportive. Yeah, um, he, was he, was, he was. He was a really, he was very supportive. And um, we're encouraged to see that advocacy efforts are still being done. And I think what I find so encouraging is seeing this next generation of disability advocates continue to work and protect the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we know that we have work ahead of us, but I know that we can get it all done together. But I wanted to thank you again for being with us today. You are, um, you are a wonderful human being. Well, you're nice to say that, Susan. Thank you very much. People always refer to me as the author of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I correct them. I'm not the author of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm the sponsor of it. Sure, I sponsored it. I wrote a lot of it. We got it through, but the authors, were all those persons with disabilities who came before, who struggled, who fought, who marched, who demonstrated, who laid down under the wheels of the Greyhound buses, uh, who chained themselves to doors, uh, all the people you saw in that movie, Crip Camp, that they're the ones that are the authors of this legislation, not me. Well, thank you. It's, we appreciate all your hard work. <laughs>